Hey everybody, it's Miss Colt again. You might notice that this video, I'm dressed exactly the same as the last one because guess what? I'm just picking up where I left off because I already had the notes. And also I like this necklace, it's from my mommy. So this is part two of why do we have to read this? And this part is what is the value in classic literature? Now, before I get too much further, I want to let you know that in the description, I have included the articles and blog posts that I found most helpful. I've put links there. I forgot to tell you that before, but hopefully if you watched the video, you saw the description and you saw the links. Anyway, they're good. The first aspect of this that I want to think about is as a teacher, because I am one. And that is why are students assigned classic literature? The first and I think most obvious reason, which is why I thought of it first, is that it's difficult, which again goes back to students' complaint of it's hard. Well, yeah, that's why, <laughs> that's why I'm here. <laughs> so teachers can provide support for students. We can break the text down into shorter, uh, less intimidating sections in a way that makes sense. It's not just like read five pages and then you stop in the middle of the sentence. You know, we can think about what sort of unit to have, how much you need to read to have it, you know, sort of be coherent. We can uh, offer materials such as study guides, uh, supplemental information, and so on that can assist students in building understanding. Additionally, there is the factor, like if you watched the previous video, Joan Didion said, about shared experience. Assigned works are often studied as a whole class. Well, different students are going to bring different experiences to their reading of a text, and readers miss out on that when they study independently. Classic works in particular often evoke interpretations that are different yet not mutually exclusive, and that helps students develop empathy and understanding for other people's perspectives. We also learn that words have power. You ever heard the saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, right. Exploring the way that words can touch people's hearts, guide their actions, and shape history and culture and have done so, encourages students to be both creative and judicious in their own use of words. And perhaps most importantly for me, is that it helps to teach students persistence despite failure. Tackling unfamiliar, dense, lengthy, and often convoluted prose increases the likelihood that students are gonna face confusion and a lack of understanding. Knowing that they are required to figure it out, that they will be held accountable for doing so, and also that they will have help, students gain the experience of developing strategies to deal with situations in which they're not successful the first time through. But finally, literature helps us develop empathy. Well-crafted fiction involves believable characters, those who seem like they really could be people, in believable, though often extraordinary, situations. Thus, the creators invite the audience to identify with these characters, to understand why they make the choices that they do. It's important to note that this applies beyond official classics, but a work whose characters seem bland and shallow and inauthentic should not be considered a classic. And that's just me saying so, and I'm not, you know, a dude or dead, so I don't know how much that's worth, but for what it's worth, that's what I think. But in addition to having to study classic literature, there are actually some people who choose, who, who actually of their own free will choose to read classic literature. Why would anybody do that? <sighs> well, unfortunately, the most common reason is a combination of arrogance and shame. Let's be honest, this is probably at the top of the list, the ever so slightly raised eyebrows. You haven't read that? The falsely humble smile followed by, I'm working my way through Dickens this year. Literary New Year's resolutions are not far behind gym memberships and kale and rarely last much longer. However, there's more to it than that. Curiosity. People wonder why everyone talks about a certain book or a movie or a song or a painting. Is it really as good as everybody says? 
Is it worth all the hype? Why? Or why not? Perhaps they've come across a classic illusion in popular culture and they're curious about what the connection is. But curiosity is a factor in another way as well. Classic works are ones that carry significance beyond their original context, which means that someone who is not from that era or culture can find relevance in a situation that is otherwise foreign to them. There is an aura of the exotic about works that are set in distant times and places. It is not simply a coincidence that long ago, in a faraway land, is immediately recognizable as the beginning of a story. So something else that we want to consider in why people read these books is what the difference is between a classic book and a fun book. Now, I want you to notice that deliberately I did not use the word enjoyable. Reading or studying a classic work can be enjoyable, even if it's difficult and challenging. In fact, in the best works, the challenge is part of what makes the experience enjoyable. I know, maybe that's hard to believe, but trust me. Fun implies superficial. And while we generally think of that as a negative quality, it's only really a problem when there's a lack of balance. The counterpoint to superficiality is depth, which is exactly what makes a classic work both enjoyable and challenging. Bear with me for an extended metaphor. In both cases, it's like snorkeling around a tropical reef. You can float lazily along the surface, looking through the crystalline water at little fish darting through the leaves of seaweed and in and out of niches in the coral. The sun is warm on your back and you can breathe easily through your snorkel. When you lift your head, there may be a moment of disorientation, your eyes becoming accustomed to the different angle of the light. But other than that, it's pretty easy to regain your bearings. Or you can take a deep breath, hold it, and kick below the surface. There's more to see as you go further down. Sea urchins, snails, fish you couldn't see from the surface, larger ones, nemini, you know, the little wavy things with their fingers. It gets cooler. The colors become more vibrant. There are layers of shadow. The fish are even larger. Your imagination begins to tease you. You become more curious about what you still haven't seen yet. Your lungs feel tight, then begin to ache, and then burn. That might have been a shark further off. You kick toward the sunlight, which is farther than you'd remember it being, and the splash as your head breaks the surface of the water echoes noisily in your ears, as does your deep gasp. Everything suddenly seems louder than it had before, intrusive after the intense silence below the ripples on the surface. You tread water as your breathing and heart rate return to normal. It takes a bit to readjust. The thing is, we have to breathe. You have to come up for air sooner or later. In the same way, Truly appreciating a classic work requires giving yourself the opportunity to reflect, to mull it over and, and process it. And once you've caught your breath, you can choose whether you want to dive in again or if you want to float around for a bit. Both choices are totally valid. However, I do tend to think that those who only ever choose one type of snorkeling are missing out on the delights offered by the other. So, hopefully I didn't miss anything. Um, if you have other thoughts about classic literature, things that you'd like to see me explore, um, I know, I feel like I say it all the time, but I love comments. Tell me below, what is your favorite classic work? Um, what about art or music? Um, what makes something for you particularly meaningful? What do you look for? Uh, let me know. And other than that, bye for now.